Hello everyone and welcome back to Shelf Life. I'm Simran and this is a podcast where we talk about books, their philosophies, but most importantly, our personal relationship with the book. Before we begin with this episode, I just want to say a huge huge thank you to everyone who's been listening in to our podcast for the past 9 weeks. Uh we're in our 9th episode now. This is our 9th episode and we are extremely happy with the kind of progress we've made. uh with the kind of progress we're making and everything you know it it just we couldn't have asked for more thank you so much for tuning in uh for being a part of our family for being a part of this community that we're trying to build um in fact i just want to let y'all know uh, uh that last week's episode which i recorded with my mother uh the episode on jewel's children if you haven't checked it out you can always go ahead uh on our channel page and uh, check it out you personally um uh, particularly lo- loved that episode and uh i loved reading all the comments that you sent in and uh just amazing anecdotes and which is why i want to take a minute here um to mention one particular anecdote that really made my heart melt and um you know it it just it reminded me of how through books so many of us are connected in ways that we don't even understand but our stories are weaved together through uh this book and through so many books and that's the joy of reading that's why we started this podcast that's why um i'm so passionate about continuing with it because reading is beautiful it's a journey and it's an experience uh let's get back to the anecdote at hand so this was sent in by uh miss vijayanti joshi Uh I'm going to just read out what she said. Great podcast. Want to lay my hands on the book as soon as possible. Your mom also has a very rich and soothing voice. This podcast was very touching, enjoyable and a spiritual experience. Your talk took me down the memory lane many years back when I lost my grandfather. As my husband was in the army and we were in a remote area, I learned of his death 8 days later. it was very very painful really the best episode so far and you know when i read this message i just it made me feel so uh, happy uh, in the sense that to know that what we spoke about and such a personal part of our story if you if you have forgotten by any chance what i'm referring to um it's the story my mother said about the telegram um which was a part of jubel's children where you know in the olden times when someone died um because there were no phones available or there was no whatsapp you had to send in a telegram and you know that would sometimes reach a day or two late and um uh, in all that time someone you loved has passed away and you don't even know that um and we were talking about this and my mom shared her experience and we were talking about our grandfather and um to know that what we spoke about that someone else as well and made them think about their own grandfather and their own lives that was beautiful and uh, so i just want to say a huge thank you for tuning in and uh, i hope that you keep listening yeah moving on let's get to our book for the week so like i said this week we're going to be talking about 1984 by george orwell um now some of you must have already read the book uh it's a quite it's quite a classic you might have already you know picked it up when you were kids or later on um some of you might have read it because i spoke about it last week <laughs> if you are one of them thank you so much um but some of you may have not read it and that's completely fine too um what i want to tell you where i'm getting at through this <laughs> really long introduction is that there is not a single person on this planet who has not met this book there is not a single person on this planet who doesn't know about this book and i'm going to tell you why i know like uh i'm while we're recording this uh, <laughs> my producer uh is sitting sachi is sitting right in front of me and just as just as i said that <laughs> there is not a single person on this planet who's not read this book uh Uh, who's not met this book uh she just like raised her finger 
<laughs> signaling that she is one of those. Um, but I, I can assure you that even you, Sachi, have met this book. And let me explain to you how. Brick Brother, Big Brother is watching you. Have you heard of that statement before? I'm sure you have. And um, you know, at least if you haven't heard of that statement, you know who Big Brother is. You know what that means. You know what that signifies, right? And um, of course, I mean, I'm I'm sure you know about Big Big Brother through through the years, through uh, so many you know changes in the media and everything, has gradually become Big Boss, <laughs> as we know it. Um, it's become this popular TV show where a strange Unna- uh, unnamed and you know unseen man um, m- man's voice is controlling the lives of so many people who live in um, a house together who are stuck in a house together that's the concept of big boss and uh, he literally pushes them to their breaking point and that's that as a concept has been picked up from big brother and Big Brother <laughs> was a concept that was first introduced in 1984 by George Orwell. Um, and it essentially talks about big, the, like the way Big Boss is working as well. So it talks about, um, you know, it, the year is 1984. And this book was written in 1948. So uh, it's a dystopian novel and it's written you know, to signify literally the reverse of everything that is happening, the the worst case scenario. Um, and the year is 1984. And, um, you know, there is all the governments in the world have essentially merged together or clubbed together to form three rival governments. Um, and uh, the protagonist that we know so the protagonist is a man a 39 year old man named Winston Winston Smith and we see the world mostly through his eyes Um, and we he is a member of the party the political party in power Um, and that political party is a totalitarian government so it essentially cannot be uh, uprooted and it rules over uh, all of its citizens lives so the idea is to create a kind of um, nation where everybody is the same. Everybody is homo- homogenous. There's no individuality. There's no personal, uh, uh, you know, dream or aspiration. You live for the state. You live for uh, the nation. And imagine having a life like that. I mean, I know we did this and I don't want to get in too much into it because we did already an episode uh, on We the Living which had quite a similar story. You can also check that out on our page uh, where a government, you know, really controls your life. It controls everything you say and do. It controls where you go, what you wear, what you eat, um, what you watch, who watches you. It controls everything. And in that same sense, we come back to this world in 1984, um, where George Orwell is essentially imagining a world um, in 1984 where there is this totalitarian government that has taken over the world, you know, and um, and people have essentially lost all their rights. They live like complete zombies, <laughs> in a sense, you know, they're, they're stripped away from everything that they might want. Uh, which might go against uh, the ideals of the party. And, um, you know, it's interesting because this book was written, obviously, with, you know, if I have to give you some context, it was written right after World War II. So, um, you know, the atmosphere in that was prevailing when George Orwell sat, sat down to write this book, um, there, were already, there was already a fascist government in power that had, you know, caused so much damage um, and left such a huge mark on human history. There was already so much war and devastation that had taken place that it it makes sense that a man sat down and said, you know what, I think the world is going to be completely different in um, 20 years, 40 years time. And I'm going to write about that because it looks different now. And um, I know we all think about 
you know how much better times could be um but they could also be worse and that's the whole idea of a dystopian novel a dystopian novel essentially embraces uh the uncertain it embraces the worst case scenario um it's your worst nightmare come to life <laughs> um and it, on this podcast we're going to be discussing you know a lot of books a lot of dystopian novels a lot of um uh, hopefully utopian novels but <laughs> um we're going to be talking about a lot of books but this one you know i think you should know that this is the one that started them all f- for me i feel um it's considered a classic in uh, dystopian literature and it's honestly it's written absolutely beautifully and um so like i said that you know like like we've already established all of us listening to this podcast um all of us listening to this episode have met the book in some way or another um so <laughs> if you know if i don't if i have to scare you <laughs> i might just go ahead and say that big brother has watched all of us <laughs> uh in a sense but um yeah but that's not if i have to talk about how i specifically met the book um it was it's quite an interesting story because i actually had this book as um you know as as my as a subject uh for my literature semester so my first semester in college uh which was last year uh i had this book as a part of my curriculum so this was the first time i was reading uh, a novel for academic purposes and uh let me just tell you if you're <laughs> someone who has studied english literature as part of their curriculum uh as part of their you know uh, through college or whatever uh reading for pleasure and reading for academic purposes two completely different things um and i know people for whom this completely ruins the experience of reading uh when they're going deep into the book because they want to write a paper about it <laughs> and i know people who have actually benefited from it you know who felt that they could um grow their horizons and read a lot of books that you know usually they might not have picked up uh but for me it was very different and it was you know a little uncomfortable at first but i think i learned to really enjoy it as well so first semester this is again this is like first week of college okay this is the first time i'm in college and first semester in and we are told you know this is a huge book and you're going to have to study it and critique it critique it and you're going to write an entire paper on it <laughs> and um you know you're excited at first but then you realize this is a classic piece of literature you know this was written years ago with language that is completely different from what we speak today what we read today uh <laughs> this is going to be graded your views are going to be graded you're going to be taken seriously by someone um you know and when that sets in <laughs> that kind of uh shakes you up a little bit um uh, so i just i still have you know memories of uh sitting in the college library being surrounded by you know the old smell of books um and just sitting for hours and with my best friend and we were just racking our brains before the paper um you know going over chapters going over everything that we possibly could and feeling like you know why did we take this why did we why are we here but you know in the end it just it all works out and you realize there's so much that you learn when you really get deep into a book get deep into the essence of a book and i clearly learned a lot so um the strangest memory of this that i have of this book is not the fact that i had to spend a lot of uh, late nights <laughs> cramming a lot of information in my head but the strangest memory um goes back to the very basics the strangest memory i have of this book is the language now i had read dystopian novels before uh not a lot not in detail but it's not a genre that i liked a lot but this book th- was the first dystopian novel that really really you know shook me um and most of it was because of the language um and i say that because on this podcast you know we've talked so much about the power of words 
right? Um, even in our Lolita episode, we talked about the significance and power of words and how they make and break things and how uh, they shape entire histories and how we perceive things. They, sh- they shape our perception. Um, but what I also want to talk about is the kind of violence that can exist in language, the kind of vi- violence that can be used uh, through language and the kind of pain that can be inflicted through language. Uh, because that is also something that's very interesting and something that we don't really talk about too much, right? And that's like that brings us to one of the most important themes of this book. It's the violence in the language. Um, and there's there's so many instances that really, when you're reading the book, really make you feel like, oh my God, this is going to attack me, uh, you know? Like, I'll give you an example. When the book starts, it starts with the line, the clock strikes 13. Not 12, <laughs> not 1. It strikes 13. It gives you a sense of this strange world uh, you're entering where there are 13 hours in the day uh, in you know uh, on the clock uh, and there's uh, everything that you know essentially about your world is something that you have to leave behind and you're entering this world where things are going to be uncomfortable and uh, you know that line because I had this, you know, I had to read it for a paper and everything. Um, We obviously got really into it technically as well. The sense that, you know, what that represented um, for a book, why it was written and all of that. But, you know, if you really look into it and you don't have to be a literature student um, to understand that that line in itself is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for things being too late for the time being too late to change anything to rebel to uproot to make a difference it's too late Um, it's a symbol for being for things just being too strange Uh, for you being in a world where clocks can strike 13 where the world can be unpredictable and uh, dangerous and that lang- that violence, that eeriness that comes with language, you know, it's more than just, um, uh, it's not restricted just to the environment that George Orwell is describing. Even in the relationships in the book, and I'm not spoiling anything for you here when I say that at the core of 1984 is a forbidden love story, okay? And like I said, our main character, uh, our protagonist, Winston Smith, uh, is a 39-year-old man who lives alone and uh, he begins a forbidden relationship with another party member, uh, another person who works for the government, um, Julia, her name is. And, you know, they begin an uh, illicit affair and essentially everything that happens in their life uh, because of that affair and because of their personal ideals is what shapes the book. But at the core of 1984... Right is of course a forbidden love story, because <laughs> what transcends all genres, uh, what transcends all uh, uh, all kinds of feelings and all kinds of um, realities, love, love is what uh, builds everything, builds any kind of relationship or any kind of story in any kind of world. It could be dystopian or it could be your <laughs> utopia but what remains what comes out of it what exists exists because of love and um you know moving on we're going to talk a lot about that but again i want to emphasize on uh, how the definition of love is actually amorphous um, it changes in every situation your standards your uh, the way you perceive love changes right And in a dystopian world, George Orwell is trying to tell us that love is actually violent. It can be violent um, because of the way, and we see this because of the way that Winston Smith describes his lover. Um, You know, the way he looks at her. Uh, He calls her, and I quote, a rebel from the waist down. Uh, (laughs) I don't think anybody in their right mind would 
uh, probably <laughs> look at their lover and say that and, and hint that that you know they're essentially immoral you wouldn't do that um and if i have to like go a little bit further if i have to push you a little bit on this and push this topic a little bit um you know uh, <laughs> on to you i would say i would quote another few lines from the book and this is when they're you know when they're realizing that they have feelings for each other they're attracted to each other they're trying to begin that relationship uh, he right uh, he thinks he would flog her to death with a rubber truncheon he would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax um and you know this is how <laughs> he talks about the woman that he loves um he repeatedly tells her the more men you've had the more i love you um you know it it every gesture that she made seemed like a whole civilization had been annihilated and that really gets to you that really stands out because you you think about how uh your definition of anything changes in a different world when you live in times that are different from the way that they are right now you think about how you would perceive your families as well how would you perceive uh, your friends how would you p- perceive friendship um you know and that so that violence in language you know that is a trait that exists in all dystopian books but here it brings it's brought out beautifully and it's brought out so prominently and it just i just remember you know now that i'm narrating all of this <laughs> i can completely go back and um to that time when i read the book in college for the first time and i remember my professor explaining it to us and um telling us you know how absolutely morbid <laughs> um it is to be able to write that way uh but it's also genius <laughs> it's also a masterpiece um and to to create something that is so scary that is so dangerous but also so true So let's move on to our another th- important theme um of this novel and this is something that I really want you guys to think about this is something that I really want to leave you all with um and that is that the book is essentially about one thing and one thing only and you can you can argue this a lot that you can say that oh it's about you know how an individual stands against the uh, state how people's voices are submerged by the state and manipulated by the state you can talk about all of those things how love uh, cannot is not allowed to exist um uh, it, with the presence of a totalitarian government he can talk about all of that but the essence of the book the essence of this story um and in fact any uh, dystopian story i felt was the inherent contradiction in it and i think that's the the fact that inherent contradictions exist in all of us as human beings goes even further and it, it leads us to question even more than what we already would so it, it it's quite when i say contradiction um an inherent contradiction i clearly mean that you know when we hear about totalitarian governments when we hear about fascist governments um there's obviously the first thing that strikes us is a sense of falsity right there's always that um idea that this is a state that's trying to hide they're trying to hide something they're doing something that they don't want the world to know um and you can think about it even now like i know we talk a lot about being in the modern world where things are different and all of that but totalitarian governments still exist um and if you look around if you actually look around you will see them and um think about it how many governments in this world are actually trying to hide something from you what are they trying to hide and if we think about that that um there are so many governments in fact that try to do that um and that brings us to again to george orwell's book and the fact that he wrote this uh before you know 
any of us could have predicted it as being you know absolutely timeless he he wrote this um almost as a prophecy uh you know and uh, he writes it you know in the book he explains he gets more into uh detail about how there's a f- sense of falsity and there's a inherent contradiction that um these huge apparatus these state apparatus agencies have um he writes about ministries for example if i have to take uh if i have to give you an example from the book i'll give you this is about the ministry so the, the so the government has many departments essentially right uh it has the ministry of plenty it has the ministry of love it has the ministry of you know there's a lot of a lot of things there's um different ministries that give out different kind of information that are responsible for uh, a lot of things but uh the irony in all of this is that um uh, whatever the ministry is for it's essentially trying to hide that it's essentially trying to circumvent it um for example and this is a line that i absolutely love uh from this book this is a line that you know when i read it i just thought oh so genius uh so so smart and <laughs> uh absolutely brilliant to have you know even perceived this to have come up with this um <laughs> and i have these oh ho moments a lot when i'm reading a good book and that's how i gauge if a good book is you know worth being uh called a masterpiece or not when i have that moment where i'm just like wow how did you think of that um and i'll read to you that one line about where that inherent contradiction really comes in and um even where where i had my aha moment <laughs> for this book and it goes a little bit like this the ministry of love was really frightening there were no windows in it at all winston had never been inside it it was a place important to enter except on business and then only by penetrating through a maze of barbed wire entanglements and i don't want to you know i don't really want to get into it too much because i want to let you explore what i've just read out in your own way and interpret it in your own way but think about it he's talking about the ministry of love and he's talking about how there are no windows in it at all um what could that be a metaphor for the fact that in a dystopian world in a totalitarian government's rule under a totalitarian government's rule uh the ministry of love has no windows it's a closed door love is something you keep inside you it's private it's forbidden uh to love is to break a rule and that's what this government is trying to do that's what that's what they don't want you to do they don't want you to form connections they don't want you to feel they want you to just work and work and toil um but they don't want you to feel anything for the work that you do you know and i just felt like this was such a smart thing to write about um and that inherent contradiction thing it goes even beyond that it goes even beyond just relationships it goes um it it reaches even the top of the tier so big brother who throughout the book is not shown to us he's not we don't meet him we don't you know know anything about him we don't know how he has come to be uh because the government has also um surprise surprise taken over all of the history and changed the history uh to fit uh change the dates the the everything the year they've changed it to fit their narrative so you essentially everything that you know about the past you know through your memory um uh, you know through whatever you have been through and there is essentially a new generation who will not know anything um about what has happened you know and 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 that really um uh, when i when i talk about big brother and when i talk about how the inter- inherent contradiction thing goes till the top tier i say that big brother as a name is supposed to mean is supposed to signify a familial tie right it's supposed to f- signify some kind of uh family oriented feeling 
but in the book the irony again the contradiction is that big brother tries to severe, severe all familial ties he tries to break away anyone he tries to um, get you to out anyone in your family who's against secretly against the government uh, and there's a reward for it you will be rewarded for that um, you're supposed to tell on your own family and that uh, that as a thought can be a really frightening one um, you know where a government is essentially telling you to uh go against even what is known to you what is blood what is sacred to uh honor something that has been cultivated um uh, that thought that level of brainwashing <laughs> um well let's just hope that we don't ever have to see that right um and Uh, that inherent contradiction the fact that even the book uh, Win- winston smith um it's the character of winston he's named winston because george orwell was trying to do you know word play on um the 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 time that he lived in so he lived in the time of winston churchill um and he was trying to make not i would not say a joke i would not say a mockery but he he was trying to use that as a message uh to send out you know the fact that he used the name winston um by taking inspiration from winston churchill he's trying to send a message there and i want you to figure that out on your own uh but the fact that this piece of literature was literally written to represent a period in history that was so so traumatic that was so ghastly but at the same time the contradiction is in the fact that this book is timeless this book the story um goes beyond its time goes beyond what it meant to represent and it stands true even now years later years and years later it's being taught in colleges in schools why why do people still pick it up from the stands because it stands true because there is something we can still relate to there is something that we can still find honest right uh, that level of honesty still exists where does that come from that again it perpetuates that inherent contradiction that exists with this book um and you know this is something that i don't i'm not sure if um i i have it written in my notes but i'm not sure if my professor had proposed this idea i think she did and you know when i heard it i was just <laughs> i lost my mind because it was so so uh, frightening to even think of um but she said that when you're talking about inherent contradictions and the ironies in the book right um it basically means that if we could think about how far this contradiction thing really stretches any opposition to the party any opposition to the government what if it's actually part of the party itself what if that opposition has been cultivated by the party to keep its citizens um under check and everything that so essentially all the if you could imagine all the riots that happen in your country right if you could imagine all the social political movements the protests the all of that all of that that happens in every country what if it's actually part of the government's plan what if this is all <laughs> uh, an entire grand scheme uh, that governments around the world are playing against their own people what if we're all just cogs in the wheel <laughs> i realize that we're getting really you know we're getting going from a really serious with this and it might sound very disheartening but it's something to really think about it's something that each of us has to figure out on your own um and i i really want you to figure this out because the time that we live in um the kind of things that we see in our world we need change we need hope we need something more something better so if this book is a way for us to remember what not to be how not to turn out that's good enough and i would say you know i think this story was told this is a question that we keep coming back to right why was the story told i think the story was told because every generation needs to have hope every generation needs to know that 
it has to be better it can't be worse we can't go back to where we came from we can't go back to 1948 when this book was written uh, and we also shouldn't have to imagine a world like 1984 um and it is our responsibility to do something to change um and to make that utopia a reality not this dystopia um you know so that's what i want to leave you with and i would i would love if you could get more into it and if you've read the book if you have any particular thing that you liked about it you can always write in to us you can always comment it down you can send us um you can always dm it to us as well on instagram or you could um email it to us my email id is in the description box um i hope you really like this episode because i wanted to do one on dystopia and i thought you know um uh, this could be <laughs> an interesting one to start with um moving on for next week next week's episode we have another special book we have uh Janice Perriot's Boats on Land and for the first time ever we are going to be doing a collection of short stories it's not a novel but a short story collection um and if you've not picked it up p- pick it up now it's absolutely brilliant and we will discuss it at length next week thank you for tuning in and i hope you enjoyed this episode